Hi there. Um, so I'd really like to talk to you today about the role that artists are playing in the wider society um, outside the sort of narrow confines of the art world and how organisations like Wising Arts Centre are helping artists do that. Wising is located just outside Cambridge, so it's just outside the village of Bourne. Um, it's on 10 acres of land. It's a converted farm, so we've got lots of open space, lots of space to think. Um, we've got 10 separate buildings on the site. Some of them are purpose-built, like this new studio building, which was completed a couple of years ago. Um, the original farm was 17th century, so there's a lot of kind of different types of buildings around the site. And Wising operates as a kind of informal campus. So we call it a research and development centre for the arts. We don't think about it as a gallery, even though we do have a gallery. And um, I suppose what we're ultimately trying to do at Wising is to bring artists together in very uh, structured ways to think, to look at ideas. So we're all about ideas, and all we do at Wising, all the time, is talk. <laughs> we talk about art, we talk about um, wider concepts, and we try and look at ways of bringing um, other people outside the arts into those conversations. So, we, you know, this, when I talk about Wising, sometimes I think this perhaps sounds a little bit over-constructed in many ways how we operate, but um, hopefully what we're trying to do is create a, a structure of operating at Wising which allows things to happen. And um, to do that, we approach our annual programme as a theme, within a theme. So, for example, in 2009, for the whole of 2009, we explored the theme of generosity. Last year, 2010, we explored the improbable and um, we had a three-month international camp for improbable thinking on this site. And during that camp, what we did was we invited lots of people to come in and look at what the improbable meant. So in this scenario here, this is a public event, it's a talk, we're looking at improbability in maths. And the, the talk was actually led by Dr. David Spiegelhalter, that's him with the beard here. Um, he teaches mathematics at Cambridge University, so, and he's written on chance and probability in maths. So we invited outside speakers, you know, Cambridge is a fantastic resource, there are amazing people in Cambridge right on our doorstep, to come into our programme to, to sort of just kind of agitate and throw new ideas into the mix within an arts context. So around this kind of room, there's a number of different kinds of people there. There are artists who were on this three months count from probable thinking. What, what I mean by that is they were at Wising for three months on a residency together from Brazil, um, Turkey, UK, parts of Europe. So they're all there thinking about the improbable with the ultimate aim of making new work coming out of that theme. And alongside the artists in this room at the moment are members of the public. So we, we, we try to make the process of generating artistic ideas as public as possible. And um, so, you know, what we've got in that scenario is that artists sitting there thinking about their work in context of, with the subject of the improbable. We've got Dr. Spiegelhalter talking about chance and probability in maths. And we've got the public in there interacting and throwing in their ideas around improbability. And this is Dr. Speaker Halter talking about uh, chance and um, a computer program he created about uh, how your lifestyle might affect how long you're going to live, for example. But we also try and to do, you know, push these ideas out to create, you know, to reach all sections of the community, all age groups. So again, this was the same person, Dr. Speaker Halter, led a public workshop in our gallery on, and what we were actually doing in this workshop was actually articulating an extremely complex mathematical theory called the bell curve theory. But not everyone in that room would have known, well, in fact, no one in that room would have known that he, they, they were actually involved in looking at the bell curve theory. What they thought they were doing was taking part in a game around numbers and probability. And again, you know, you have got art, artists sitting in amongst the audience. Um, not, you know, no one's, there's no distinction between who the participa participants in our programmes are. Um, and everyone gets involved thinking about new ways of looking at the world around us. The complexity of what we do at Wising is about sort of reaching out to bring people into the process of making art, ultimately. And it might not be what art what you might sort of necessarily expect that to be, painting or sculpture, for example. It can be something 
you know, ultimately very, very ambitious. So I, I suppose what we're trying to do within the research context at Wising is to push what is possible in the arts. And um, one of those projects I'm just going to tell you about uh, was a very transparent project around <coughs> how people can be brought into creating something really very ambitious. Sorry, I keep doing that. Um, so in the year of generosity, we wanted to test the generosity of people uh, who live and work around Wising because we're very embedded in our rural location. Bourne Village is extremely important to us and I often feel guilty that we're constantly picking on the residents of Bourne to say, come and be a part of what we're doing here, but they do really get involved and we've got a very close relationship with the village. Um, so for this project, what we did was we, we invited two artists um, from Germany, Volker Kobbeling and Martin Kaltwasser, to come, uh, to come to Wising on a residency and we, within the year of generosity we wanted to build a communal structure for communal use. That was the, the premise. Ultimately, what we were trying to do was create a barn raising type exercise to see if people would be get involved in creating an extremely ambitious artwork. So what we did, we put out a call to ask people to give us things that they didn't want anymore, that we could create this communal building for communal use with. And we had bring your rubbish weekends. Uh, we had all sorts of activity. We linked, linked with the, the local school and uh, had recycling events. We had um, we created whole bike rides from different parts of the area to Wising to, to, to take part in talks, a little bit like the slide I showed you previously, where people would sit around looking at the subject of kind of recycling waste and how ultimately something that people, someone didn't want anymore could be transformed by artists into something useful and beautiful. So the, this is our gallery, actually, not what you might expect a contemporary art gallery to look like. I did bring someone in here once and they said, oh, it just looks like my shed. And I was like, well, exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's an, it's an archive of unwanted things, is what it is. And um, so this archive of unwanted things built over, up over six weeks. And then we put a call out saying, right, now we've got the materials, you've given us all these incredible materials, our gallery is full of all of this raw material, we want to create something with it, and we want you to be part of creating it. So we put a call out, another call saying, um, you know, if you haven't got anything better to do this summer, why don't you come to Wising and help us build a structure with this material? So on any given day, we didn't know whether anyone would turn up to help. <laughs> um, luckily they did. So we had over 200 people took part in this over six weeks. Um, and, you know, you arrived on site, got a quick induction on how to use a drill, uh, bit of health and safety, you know, filled your form out, just in case anything went wrong. Uh, and, um, and then the, the people who came to take part in building the structure, they weren't simply there to provide free labour for the artists. They became actively engaged in the making of, and thinking about what this structure might mean, because ultimately what we were doing was creating a totally recycled, a, a, a structure that's completely from things that people didn't want. So ultimately, a completely recycled structure. And because of that, we had to think really carefully about, around the ethics of, you know, should the foundations of a recycled building penetrate the surface of the earth? We talked about that every day for two weeks until it was agreed within the group who was managed to stick with it that long that no, actually, it would be unethical for us to put some concrete pile in, pylons down. You know, we must think of another way of doing that. So we had to go through this long, convoluted process of creating ballast and, you know, we had to invent a way of weighting down this building that wouldn't affect the surface of the earth. And ultimately, you know, we didn't really know necessarily, we didn't start with a plan, we didn't have a drawing to say, you can imagine what going to the planning officers at South Camps District Council was like with that one. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't know what the materials were, we didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, but my caveat at all times is it's an artwork which just works every time. So, <laughs> so we, we did uh, manage to get planning permission and the South Camps, thank you, were really wonderful about it. So, you know, this structure grew over and it became an aesthetic process. You know, people were making aesthetic decisions around what it was going to look like with the materials. And we did end up with a two-story, completely recycled building, which, um, you know, really captured the imaginations of the public and went global because Reuters picked up on it. And I was on Good Morning America talking about recycled buildings. And, you know, it was a really fantastic project. For, and, to me, what we're trying to do at Wising is demonstrate how the arts can play a wider role in society and the world. So it's not simply about you know, an artist making 
well, it's perfectly fine. And we do have people painting in our studios and exhibiting those paintings in galleries. But there is another way of operating here that we feel that we, we perhaps uniquely in the UK, in fact, are doing. And mainly because of the resources that we've got around our site and facilities and our approach to this kind of campus model. So, you know, in this building, we've done all sorts of things. We've had screenings around... Um, you know, other kinds of uses of recycled buildings. And I, I just have to say that this building was completely free, you know, apart from the fees to the artist to, to, to be at Wising for three months. You know, not, it didn't cost us any money at all. And it was a process that people really bought into and became very closely involved with. The following summer, 2009, uh, yeah, 2009, we invited an artist um, to do a residency in the, the building looking at alternative energy sources for it. And she worked with the... Um, the uh, sustainable engineering department at Cambridge University, a PhD student, adapting dynamos. That you, they went to Toys R Us, basically, found lots of children's toys that had dynamos in those, and adapted them and embedded the dynamos throughout the building. So under the floorboards, on the stairs, you know, in little kind of gizmos and gadgets around the building. And then we work, we put a call out, another call, we do this all the time, put a call out saying, does anyone want to come and help us animate this building through dance? And we worked with the community uh, choreographer um, and, put, and a number of the people in the shot actually helped to build the building the year before. They came back and they, they, helped, they took part in this dance project in which we animated the building through this choreographed dance project. And it was a really wonderful event. We got a lot of people along to see it. And, you know, as well as having that actual event, we, we had invited Cambridge Carbon Footprint in so you could come and have your carbon footprint tested whilst watching these people animating this building through dance. And when I say animating, you know, ultimately the, the dynamos were storing energy for very short periods of time and they were just creating light and sound. So, but, but ultimately, what, you know, I suppose what we're trying to contextualise all the time, what we're doing and saying, well, you know, did you think about another energy source or have you thought about maybe waste and what can, we can use it for so we can actually do something really useful with the things around us, the everyday objects? And I suppose, for me, that's the kind of power of the arts and artists, is that they make us look at our worlds in a different way and, and you know, throw open new possibilities of working. Another project, I should just say that the, these two artists also went on, um, immediately after Wising, were invited, were spotted by the, um, the Architectural Association and invited to take part in the London, or the, yeah, the London Festival of Architecture last year. And they created this amazing building on Bankside. Again, another thing, you know, they put a call out, they invited people to give them materials, they, people helped them build it. It's a 120-seat theatre on Bankside, and they worked with a, a theatre company programming um, theatre productions around recycling climate change um, ecological issues. And this was a really successful part of the London Festival of Architecture. Another architectural structure that we created at Wising was this. This, this uh, again, is the world's, it's, <laughs> it's the world's first walking house. It really is. <laughs> I'm not making that up. I feel slightly inadequate after the robot woman because her robots are better than ours. <laughs> but, um, you know, I suppose we didn't necessarily start out to create a walking house. At we never, ever start out with an end point in mind at all. You know, that's just the opposite of how we work there. So, in, you know, we think about location, we think about context, we think about ideas. And for this... Um, work to be created, we invited these artists, uh, N55, based in Copenhagen, to come and work with some, a marginalised community near Wising, a group of uh, travellers. And, you know, all the time we're trying to bring in new, new audiences for the, you know, into a kind of inaccessible ways of reaching out into perhaps more marginalised communities that are living around Wising. So the artists worked with the travelling community for nearly two years, um, looking at perhaps utopian aspects of traveller lifestyle that have fallen, fallen, but maybe that we've forgotten. You know, the fact that in the past, travellers really did travel. You know, they weren't made to stay in sites where they didn't really know anyone. Um, and, yeah, the, I suppose the artists sort of kind of rediscovered this spirit of, of utopian travel with, through working with this, these families and developed a kind of um, alternative model, for perhaps, for the future, for all of us. Um, I should say, you know, all the artists that we work with in this way are completely radicalised in how they operate. They, you know, they actually live this life as much as telling us that we should also be living like this. So for these artists, they really believe that no one should own land, that 
ownership of land should be given to everyone, and that we should all be allowed to be mobile and have, and to, to uh, I think their phrase is, to tread lightly on the earth and leave little uh, traces of ourselves behind us. So through a two-year process of research and thinking and coming back and uh, discussing and looking at um, the kind of legal issues around ownership of land, for example, uh, they developed a concept of a walking house. And I think at what that stage, it was only a concept, until uh, the Arts Council very kindly said they would give me some money to prototype it. So we did actually build this. Um, and it is, you know, it, it brings in ideas around perhaps how as individuals we might think about how we live our lives again. So it's powered by solar energy. It's got a composting, well, it hasn't even got a composting toilet. It's, I won't describe the toilet. <laughs> Just, it's basic, let's put it that way. Um, and it's got a, a water filtration system. So rainwater is collected from the roof. It's filtered through plants on the side. You can't really see it. It's on this side. And then, so for example, after you've done your dishes and you don't want to throw away dishwater, that might have some be contaminated. You can tip it in the roof. It'll go through this plant system, come out as cleaner water, and then you can dispose of it ethically. Um, it's got a wood-burning stove, so the idea is that you, you set off in your walking house and uh, you find fallen wood on the way to, to, heat, to heat your house. And, yeah, that's the sink. And so, so on, on the left, we've got where you wash your dishes, and this is the toilet here, so that you, don't, you take it out to, to use it. Um, it's powered by solar energy, and the energy is stored in batteries on the roof. And I'm, the thing I'm probably most proud about well, apart from the fact that we actually even built this in the first place, is that um, we, the artist created a collaboration with MIT in Massachusetts. So an engineer <coughs> at Massachusetts worked with those artists on developing the technology to make the legs work. So it uses a new, you know, they literally had to invent a way for this giant house to walk. So, you know, BRE and um, the artist N55 are still having a conversation, as far as I know, around creating a kind of modular housing system that potentially in the dream, you know, this is, a to this is an idealistic way of looking at things, which is the way I always look at things, but, you know, what if artists really did help um, sort of ultimately change, you know, using the arts as a way to change behaviour around some of these bigger issues and, um, and to take some of these ideas not only sort of into the, the wider world, but perhaps affect even things like um, policy and government policy around things like housing. So anyway, that's it from me. Thank you very much.